Hello, good morning and welcome to Sunrise Daily Today. I'm Chamberlain Osama. Well, it's a beautiful Wednesday morning here in Lagos. It's Thursday, actually. <laughs> it's a beautiful Thursday morning. I'm Kyle <laughs> Okiki. Uh, I mean, when you've just, just been told that you now have access to paternity leave. <laughs> Shots fired, right? I, mean, you don't have, uh, I don't. I'm not a civil servant. Why is that headed? Okay. Amaya Wakede, good morning and welcome. Hey, come on. I mean, it's only, that's the only time you have some um, brief amnesia, you know, of what... You know, I think you're, civil you're, servants, I think, private servants, everybody? No, just civil servants. And you, you, I, I think you're actually projecting this point. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a civil servant, I'm for but, crying out loud. Uh, I don't know if they want to turn back the hands of time, <laughs> because uh, we know that certain rivers are passed under the bridge, mm. you know, but... Um, well, there is River State. There's Cross, Cross River, River State. Right. <laughs> oh. and there are many rivers and in Nigeria. The and then there is that song by Jimmy Cliff, Many Rivers to Cross, mm. and on and on like that. So. Okay. All right. There you go. Okay. <laughs> All right. So uh, we're going to go ahead and uh, take you through some of the dailies today because, I mean, uh, wow, you, you can almost guess, really what uh, some of the dailies will highlight uh, as a matter of fact. So uh, you're going to be seeing Mr. Wally Fatade very soon to uh, take us through some of the dailies. But um, I mean, at this point in time, I don't know if anything surprises anybody um, mm. in terms of when certain events happen and how the dailies were reflected. So it just appears as though, um, but the thing is, you know, like people always talk about when some of these things um, occur, and if you look at the headlines over time, you know that cartoon, they say spot the difference. Can there be any difference, Absolutely. really? How much difference will it be over the years? You know, there's, the there's something interesting that I've seen on the front page of uh, the Daily Times in recent time. It's one of the oldest papers in Nigeria, right? Mm -hmm. So they will go back in time and then use you know, a story uh, of something that is contemporary. Yeah. You could almost see that things that happened as far back as the 60s, 70s, 80s, side-by-side -side things that you see you know, happening today, mm. almost like they're, they're, they're the same. Yes. And that is, it just asks one question. Are we making progress? Yes. How significant? You know, one that jumps out or that I readily remember is something about the health sector. Mm -hmm. Yeah. By the way, resident doctors are still on strike uh, two months now. Wow. And I recall then it was something about nurses. Uh, I mean, that was a flashback, and just right next to that, there was something about resident doctor strike, and yeah. I mean, something we just, you can almost predict the headlines, but let's see um, what's making the headlines today. Yeah, so we'll start with uh, Vanguard newspaper today, uh, Mr. Wale Fatade, thank you, good morning, and uh, thank you for joining us today on the program. So let's start off with Vanguard newspaper, look good at morning, the lease. Yeah, good to see you again today. Good to see you too. Yeah, so Vanguard leads with killings in Southeast. Rage, despair, trail, murder of Akunyuli. Eight others by gunmen. And the writer says how Akunyuli, husband of late ex Dag boss, eight others were killed in Onicha suburb. Igbo Nation under siege with too many killings. So Hanis the Laments, it's in our hands to make this region better again. Mahi will ensure public safety, as from the police. Fish out killers, Southeast Governor's Charge Security Agencies. Bari mourns Dr. Chike Akonyi decides killers must face judgment of, okay, I think it's typo, it says of man. So, something missing there. Uh, Before, uh, maybe judgment of God first judgment of man. Okay, so judgment of man. Okay, the law is here, applying to them. Uh, it's political assassination, ascribed to IPOP. Obiano promises 20 million naira reward on Akunyuli's killers. So all of this, uh, you know, associated with this lead story. What, what could have been your impressions? I mean, um, perhaps on the desk when you got this information filtering through and up till now, Mr. Fatabi. Well, uh, first, condolences to the family of uh, Akunyuli. It's, it's so sad. Uh, I, when the news broke early yesterday morning, I, I was shaking. And the circumstances surrounding it, learning that he and his son were the function, the orgs, and then they parted. Yeah. And I, uh, as a son, I, I felt that's not the kind of memory one should have of his father for the last moment. So condolences to the family. But I think 
we, we must agree now. The Southeast is under siege. But I'm I'm wary of uh, assigning it to IPOB or no IPOB. I mean, we were here during Abacha when people were being killed. And the government then came out that they will fish out the killers, they will fish out the killers. But when the trials of Sergeant Rogers and uh, Mustafa started, we then knew that the government of the day were involved in the killings. And so we, we got to be careful by asking, I mean, by ascribing the killing to a particular set of people or organization. That's one. Number two, it, it's almost jejun now. The kind of rhetorics you hear, uh, the police will investigate, will investigate high profile assassinations in Nigeria. They've never been resolved. That's so, so sad that uh, the, uh, an old woman, she's late now. She used to tell us in Yoruba in those days that uh, our constant prayer whenever we go visiting was that our blood will not be used to wash Nigeria's sins away. I think we are, we are shedding too much blood. But the other angle that we should not forget is that the stage is set now for a number of elections not to be tidy, not to be perfect. Sincerely, wow. because what you are going to have now is there's a siege on the on the land. Few people will come out. A lot of people might not come out. And he, he, I'm just imagining a kind of father or mother whose ward or child now is in a number as a youth call member. I mean, why would my child do that service now? It's not going to happen. Mm. So that stage is set for election to be shrouded in a, some kind of a controversy already. Wow. Very sad. Well, you know, speaking about elections, there's this. Uh headline just talked uh, just above this list story uh, which is you know of equal importance you uh, might add 2023 electronic voting transmission of results way to go ascribed to jonathan age long conversation isn't it so um you think they're just trying to some people in some sectors are trying to dribble the rest of the country on this one yeah even the market women the traders now they they do pocket money i mean mobile money whatever mm -hmm. everybody is electronic and, and e money i mean e money e, e wallet the, the, is uh, i mean the to other take off day, tomorrow I, I had a young kid saying the church that his class has a whatsapp group and i was like wow <laughs> You have a WhatsApp group, you say yes, what do you do? You say we share assignment, we share notes. How, how old is this child? Um, he's just 11 or 12. Uh oh. There so you go. if those guys can yeah, navigate or manipulate those gadgets, how come the entire country? Everywhere there's technology, everywhere there's network. And our National Assembly, our government has said that we are going 5G. So what is? I mean, it's not the kind of conversation we should be asking. I mean, it's we should something. be having rather. It's like saying uh, uh, pipe bomb water or electricity in the year 2021. <laughs> Me. You know, some have said perhaps the network, there's a network in the National Assembly. Whoa! <laughs> you heard that joke, right? <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> oh dear. Well, um, <clears throat> by some demand, they were Mr. and Mrs., but I'll let them read it. Um, Don't worry. I'm I was always you. on the case of this Mr. <laughs> and Mrs., so you will enjoy, uh, you know, just enjoy that piece. But if you flip to the back page, you get. Uh, Vanguard Sports, the Chelsea join race for Osima. How many people do Chelsea want to sign? Now I advise that guy to stay in Napoli. Let him, let him stay there for he two seasons. He can develop seasons himself. Yeah. I mean, he's on fire, literally, and whatever. So let him stay. He should, he should be careful of moving. He's been through a lot. And yeah. a lot of people do not know his story. He's been marooning the... Is it Belgium or mm -hmm. Greece? I mean, he's been on loan several times before he finally got gang and then moved into this place. So I, I would advise him to stay in Napoli. Because that's a top club, Napoli. Yeah, sure. it is. And it's actually easy. on top it's of the Italian uh, Serie A now. Two goals in uh, yeah. Europa. And, and so? by the way, um, Osimen is the highest goal scorer in uh, major European leagues now. Wow. Yeah. That is lovely. Beating the Lewandowski or Ronaldo of this world. Wow. And speaking about that, uh, Messi relieved after scoring for PSG. How far do you see this PSG going? Champions League, perhaps. Well, uh, Mauricio Pochettino's job is just to keep uh, Mbappe, Neymar, and uh, Messi happy. How he does that, I don't know. <laughs> Embarrassment of riches. How he does that, I don't know. <laughs> because it goes beyond football. That's a good he, trouble. He's massaging have. ego and uh, oh, yeah. part counseling, part uh, cracking the whip. Wow. I wish him the best. He's a babysitter now. Mm. I think so. <laughs> well, let's see what's on the front page of the Nigerian Tribune for you as well. You see, Senate to Buhari declare bandits as terrorists. 30 feared killed in Niger. Kaduna shuts down telecom services, bans motorcycles. It's a page five read. And you know, speaking of a ban motorcycle, just right on top of that, you see, six months after partial ban, Lagos begins fresh onslaught against Okada. Motorcycles, of course. 
5,200 bikes seized, 60 suspects arrested, 500,000 riders fate hangs. We're, un we're under pressure, rather, to act, that's according to government. Victims speak. Only total ban can end menace, that's according to the task force. And you see government, poverty, responsible, human rights activists and lawyers. You know, we've been on this motorcycle conversation for what? Years now, especially in Lagos. Of course, across other states as well. But um, is this a way to go for you, Mr. Well, there, are, there, are, there are a lot of underlying issues that we are not addressing with this ban. And I'll tell you, uh, I've, I've been uh, a victim of Okada riding. Uh, or rider, not that I mean, they've bashed my car several times, and, I, and I've seen issues. A friend of mine, God rescued him, he was knocked down crossing the road trying to buy drugs in the pharmacy, and he landed on his cheeks. Fortunately, there was no brain damage. But we, we are treating the symptoms, not the causative uh, reasons, and I'll tell you why. Our government, the Lagos state government, successful, successive ones under Fashola and Body Uncle, at the point you come out, you abandon them. During election period, you relax because apparently the, the branch of a motorcycle riders association or whatever, or the NURTW branch, you need them for election. So there's that incestuous relationship between government in Lagos, yes, and people riding Okada. That's one. Number two, I am aware of this that policemen at different checkpoints collect money regularly from Okada riders and tricycle riders that they give them daily. And so there is a kind of way that the police have lost the authority. And that's why you see that resistance from people. In, in Ajao Estate, about two weeks now, is it about two weeks? A, 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 an assistant, a um, chief president of police, six months of retirement, who has actually set up his law chambers because he's a trained lawyer, was killed. And so those are the kind of things. When you see a group of people fighting back, there are a lot of reasons. And the last one, the, the poverty that we have is grinding. And so, by proclamation or oracular pronouncement, Okada will not disappear. <sighs> well, it's tough. Well, it's, it's, it's really... It's yeah, so, so we must so, attack it holistically. You can't just say... Uh, I mean, so, okay, now, if you have made law and you have to enforce it again, the, the first thing they teach a first-year law student is that law that cannot be enforced, don't make it. Okay. Interesting perspective there, Mr. Fatade. But take a look at this one on top of the nameplate. Or your seeks to join Rivers VAT suit against FG. So we've seen Lagos try to join now. Or your state. The more the merrier. Ask some <laughs> Let's, your test Let's go to the courts. Let's test it. The judiciary must interpret our constitution. I support that. The more the merrier. So, so why aren't we seeing some other states perhaps joining the FIRS or the FG? Um, I mean, against those other states. Do you I think went, that's perhaps uh, something we'll see? You know, we, we, um, some people love white color. Some love blue. Some love green. So it's a kind of, but these are, this is a little bit, I mean, this is political. So, and then when it's politics, you have different views. So you won't blame people. But I said the more the merrier. Mm. Let's test this in Supreme Court. Well, there's that sad one, Anger Trill's killing of Dora Quigley's husband by gunmen in Anambra. In fact, the DSS had to come out with a statement saying they're not responsible for that killing. I, I don't remember when last the DSS had to come up with a statement. Man, that's, that's sad. Killing, it's sad. It, it shows how low we have uh, mm. gone as a country that the Department of State Security, the people charged with protecting us, will have to be denied. I mean, m most likely there are things we don't know yet. Well, they put out the statement saying uh, they're not involved at all. There was, of course, that one we started with. FEC approves 14-day paternity leave for civil servants. All the best eight. to those of you who are still making babies. I mean, my last child is a teenager already, so I've retired. Well, then, you, you know what they say, though. It's not a new thing again. Yeah. Some international organizations or agencies are actually doing that. So it's good if our government is adopting so just that. catching up. Playing yeah, and I hope the channel's management will adopt that. You know what they say, though? You know, some people retire and get back into the game. Oh, and yeah. Retire. Especially if you are like Sir Alex, who came back to the management <laughs> in Chester. But some people retire and they go away. So. Well, let's leave it there for the Nigerian <laughs> Tribune this morning. <laughs> Well, the Guardian newspaper is next, and this one is also, you know, another one that is rather, I don't even know where to put it. Judges in South Africa, Ghana, earn three times higher than Nigerian colleagues. And the, uh, there's a, a document from AFPA says, Nigeria's judicial officers are among least paid globally. Appeal court president's salary equivalent to that of research fellow at NILDS. Qualified legal practitioners no longer find the bench attractive, says Adiburua. 
Ba must speak out for them, waifu. And look at this rider. Salary may be poor, allowances make it up. As a scribe to Akin Lady, the story continues on page two. So, Fatadi, what do you make of this? Well, you know, <laughs> when this story broke out, I, I've had conversation with two senior journalists this week. As a matter of fact, one is retired. And uh, he worked with international agencies, UN, AU, ECOWAS, before he retired. And we were talking. You know, the, the other thing is that which professional in South Africa is not any more than a professional in Nigeria? South African journalists are more than you and I. So, I mean, it, it's the quality of our lives here, which is abysmally poor. But I think what uh, Adeboroa Big Sam, that's why we call him those days, what he said is important. I know people who have refused invitation to serve on the bench because they can't deal with the pay. And these are people who are doing well in their legal practice. I'm aware. So I, I think we need to look at that. The, the, the quality of people we have serving as judges will not be diminishing because of the paltry pay. And uh, I remember Lee Kuan Yew now, the Singaporean leader. One of the reasons why he said civil servants then should earn very high salary in Singapore was to stand as a bulwark against corruption. And I think we need to look into that. Churches, when they are lowly paid, they are susceptible to corrupt tendencies. That's, and that's very serious. All right, let's take a look at a daily trust, uh, the lead story, uh, which uh, you might have seen reflected in some of the other dailies here this morning. Senate to Buari declare bandits as terrorists uh, bomb all their locations decision long overdue ex dig policeman missing as bandits abduct 27 in sokoto community well that we already heard before so we'll move on to this next one eu uk fbi other support efcc strategic plan but you know speaking about this quest to uh you know get the nation back on track or fight against corruption do you feel that we so far have uh, institutionalized this enough such that uh, you know if the agency even does lead to everyone knows that whoa well, wait a minute we need to be in line how impactful do you would you say all of what we've been doing i think since inception of the commission there, there, been, there have been scholarly articles research paper published on the efficiency or the kind of uh, or whether efcc have been successful and I can tell us, with the ones I've read, I mean, all of us can feel it, EFCC has not been what it was conceived to be. And I think that should be worrisome to all of us. Because everywhere in the world, globally, you see different countries have been specialized agencies fighting corruption. As of today, I still do not know why we have to separate EFCC and ICPC. Yeah, because corruption... Fact, some say it should be a department of the police. Where, based on what we see, we, we know that we need something national. United States, for instance, has the FBI, apart from the Department of Justice or each state that have their own judicial apparatus. So we need something national. And then remember, there is this international treaty on uh, illicit money or illicit cash flow that we are signatories to. I mean, we are signatory to. So that actually empower us or compel us to have an agency like EFCC. But I think the problem we have, we should look at the way and manner of the appointment of the EFCC head. Uh, we've seen successive governments being tied to the, I mean, the EFCC chair, being tied to the apron string of successive presidents. And I, I mean, he who pays the piper dictates the tune. We, we can't do anything about that. So we might have to look at the way and manner that we select the head. I mean, when the head of a fish is rotting, there's nothing we can do. And then the other thing is, how many cases has the EFCC prosecuted successfully all this while? <laughs> I mean, look at the, the drama play out in the one with the former governor now, that they are still asking for a trial, a judge threw it out yesterday. It's in the papers today. So the EFCC, I mean, for me, they can do more than they are doing now. All right. Well, the FCC says they will appeal that one, uh, as you would expect. But let's turn our attention to Nigerian News Direct uh, and see what's on the front page. You see, acreage, marginal fields, award controversies. Buhari removes our nominates Farouk Ahmed on NPRA board. Experts hail Farouk Ahmed, XMD, PPMC, XCSP, PPRA. It's a page four read, but this one might interest you, Mr. Fatadi. Lekki Tollgate, military never fired live high velocity projectiles at NSAR's protesters. That's according to a forensic expert. I understand it's a UK forensic expert. And, you know, we gave a time frame saying that, you know, in the period the military was there, 
the bullets were not fired, but afterwards was fired by unknown persons. So uh, until, until the, we find out unknown person, I, I hold the right to my belief. And by the way, kudos to your organization. Channels has stayed on that, the panel sitting. But bless you for that. Well, it's the least we can do, right? A couple of other stories you find there uh, on the front page. Name SIM integration. NCC sensitizes telecom consumers on October 31st deadline. I wonder how many times you've heard about this deadline. For what? Well, <laughs> Mr. Fatan, it's, it's not me. It's what's the, the deadline page. again? I'm asking, what's the deadline the for? Nigerian News Direct. <laughs> uh, like, well, I understand that frustration, really. For October 31st. Uh, yes. Name SIM registration. Oh, okay. Thank yeah. you. Okay, uh, well, I, I, I get you were trying to clarify. I, yeah, I wanted to know another deadline again. Maybe they will bow us again. I mean, you know, we're always having deadlines upon deadlines. <laughs> well, that's like not school assignments right. deadlines. <laughs> but do, do you think, I mean, uh, uh, this, by the time everybody gets this, uh, what, name registration, or at least if 70% of the people get this uh, name card, what stops us from saying, look, at the end of the day, if all our data is on this, why can't we use it to vote? Why not? Well, it, it, there, are, there are several databases that we have already now. That we have the BVN one, we have the NIN, we have the international passport, we have the birth certificate, we have the what else? I'm saying, what, what Those are we, resources going what into What will it take us here yeah, to harmonize all these ones? So it's, it's, uh, it's up to all of us. But then the other thing that should be of uh, concern to us, mm -hmm. and I've seen this, non-Nigerians who actually have NINs. Whoa. I've seen that, even in Lagos. Well, yeah, a, a member of the National Assembly was quoted as saying that, you know, you have people crossing the border to get... And then they just come and get yeah, it. To get some of this. So things, what's so. the point of harassing everybody to go get it if non Nigerians can get it? Yeah. <laughs> well, maybe just as we always say... Because if, if I go to... Where, I mean, have all of us are registered for NIN. Yeah. What are the documents they ask you? Exactly. <laughs> or well, your face and your fingerprints. That's all. That's not well, enough. <laughs> and by certificate, if you are younger... So. That's not enough. <laughs> well, the leadership newspaper has this one, and um, it's not very pleasant. Hours after senators' damning verdict, bandits kill 30 in Niger. That uh, story is on page four. Lawmakers want them branded terrorists, say so military should bomb them wherever they are. Anxiety grips Kaduna residents as government shuts down telecom networks today. Agulu community mourns as gunmen kill Dr. Konyeli. I don't know which one of these you want to begin with, Secretary. Well, uh, it's, it's, we, we are becoming denatured as it were to deaths in Nigeria. Because every day our stories read like these. And especially for us as journalists, I'm sure some of us are already suffering from uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD. But I think it's, it's so bad. And uh, senators, when I watched it yesterday, it, it seems laughable to me that, I mean, you don't need any legislation to declare me a man. I'm already a man, the way I was made. So do you need any legislative pronouncement before we know these guys are terrorists? I mean, yeah, and I think that's not what we should be discussing about yesterday. It's serious. The, the way we are going, and I, I'm so worried that we won't get to DRC Congo, whereby different parts of a country are under different militia groups' control. But the capital remains under the central government. I hope we will not get there. Yeah, that's what we all just talk about. But we all need to uh, do what we have to do and ensure that uh, we stave off all of that. Well, that is it today on uh, taking a look at some of the dailies this morning. Mr. Wale Fatade, thank you very much indeed for joining us today. You're welcome. All right. Well, back in a moment. Please stay with us. All right, welcome back. Well, yes, indeed, uh, quite a number of matters. The Senate considered yesterday, but the debate where they uh, did ask the federal government to designate uh, bandits as terrorists and then among several other security challenges in the country are the key areas that we will be focusing on today on the program. And as you've seen in that uh, opening slide there, we've got uh, Captain Aliyu Omar here in the studios with us. He is the CEO of Goldwater and Riversand. Uh, good morning. Thank you for joining us today. Good and morning. then we've got uh, Joshua Kabila, who joins us from our studios in Abuja. He is a former DIG operations of Nigeria Police. Then we're also going to have uh, Colonel Yami Dari, uh, who is himself former director 
Nigerian Army Legal Services. Gentlemen, good morning and thank you for joining us on the program today. Well, Captain, let me start with you. You have, uh, I mean, highlighted some of these challenges, uh, the shortcomings and what you think we should do to ensure that we get things right. Now, what does this recent perspective from the Senate do to your impression about how we're handling all of these things? Uh, well, uh, good morning. Uh, eventually, I think the chicken is coming to roost. Uh, at this point, if you ask me, I don't think uh, we should uh, be branding bandits as terrorists, okay? We shouldn't, really. We should look at it conversely now. They have earned the right to be terrorists. You know, if you want to brand them as terrorists, it's, it's an understatement. If you look at uh, terrorism from whatever angle of the spectrum, you discover that these guys have ticked off successfully every single nuance of terrorists. If you look at the cost of uh, 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 violence and its impact on our GDP, you find out that these guys have earned themselves a place there too. Uh, the cost of violence is simply the expenditure we are putting in. And, um, okay, let me relate with the viewer. Take, for example, one of the costs of violence is the loss of lives to our soldiers. So if we were to do a little bit of mathematics, how much does it take to train one soldier? Could be a general, could be other rank, just one soldier. How much does it take to train him? Just training. Forget about the cost of sustaining such a person on the field when his career starts. Just the cost of training such a person. Then we talk about other things like ordinance. We talk about other things like medicals. Everything he has to do just to come out of that factory. Let's use that alone. Let's forget about the salaries he earned up and up to the point he was killed. What quantum of money is involved per one soldier? What's the unit cost of training one soldier? And what's the economic importance of a bandit? If you look at it from that perspective, you discover that <laughs> these bandits are expendable. They're expendable. They're not adding to, they're taking out from our economic prospects. There has been social costs. There have been psychological costs. There have been cultural costs. There have been you name it. And then we now say we want to call them terrorists. Honestly, in all fairness to them, they have earned the right to be terrorists. Hmm. All right, Mark, um, Mr. Habila, uh, being a former operations person with the police, does, is it, um, I mean, just as you said, Captain Say, is it something that pretty obvious? It, it's just more like... What are we doing? Could it be that we haven't seen all of this all this while? So does it change? What changes? First of all, give us your impression. Should it be or shouldn't it be? Uh, the bandits, as we describe them, are definitely uh, people who um, have some, some, you know, ideology that, that has to do with them. Um, creating apprehensiveness, you know, testing the capability of the security, and also um, going after uh, members of the public and create fear in them and apprehension, preventing them from carrying out their daily activities. And um, these people um, kidnap, these people, you know, terminate people's life. Uh, they go after the resources of the country, particularly the mineral resources, get them out and use them. And so um, bandits are, are a group that has really, really hit this system and are also trying to try the ability and the, 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 the test. They want to test how far the security agencies could, could go. And so um, they've, they've, they've earned um, the qualification uh, to be described as um, terrorists. So, um, 
does he then mean, I mean, if you could give us a little bit of insight into how some of these things work while, while you are in service, don't security agencies come up with certain reports which they pass on, you know, upstairs concerning their suggestions and recommendations? And if they do, could this have been one of the recommend, recommendations that might have been done all that time? No, um, even when you, 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 you declare them terrorists, you still have to, uh, to get the security agencies um, united and, and get them on their, on their toes. Um, that, that, um, declaring them a terrorist does not actually solve the problems. But I think, too, that um, m a massive um, deployment of the security apparatus that we have in this country, whether it is the military, whether it is the Nigerian police, whether it is the civil defense and other security agencies, we also need to, to send in a lot of intelligence individuals to feed us with the information, to mix up with the community who sees all this crime and criminality happening at their doorstep. Um, uh, I think what we need to do is to, is, to, is to increase the tempo of, of, of operation by also making available the logistics and the equipment that these security agencies need. There, are, there, are quite, there is a gap um, in, 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 in funding um, um, operations of, of these people. And uh, if, if we really bring them together, because we have, we, we, when we synergize, there's likelihood of, of, of a checks and balance that will be so, so, so robust that will prevent these people from, from getting, going far beyond where they are. And so I think that um, the security agencies must double their effort. They must also go back to the drawing board. And uh, synergy is very important. Uh, when, when you synergize, then it means that um, there is um, division of labor and then uh, assignments are, are, are shared. And um, if, if also the intelligence um, group of, of, of the security agencies in this country also move out, they have a lot of intelligence, they have a lot of um, information as to what happened, and uh, the, the community definitely are ready to, you know, to, to, to tinker with them and also to, to give um, information and intelligence um, freely. And so I think that um, we have to go back to find out what have we done wrong. Is it the funding? Or is it the, 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 the program for operation, the operation order that is being directed? And, 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 and I think that we have to do that quickly because uh, these criminals are testing the ability of our security agencies to see how far they could go. Well, Captain, this uh, appears to open up a new uh, perspective. So is it designated them as terrorists that is at the base of uh, the challenge of addressing it or funding because some argue well even if you designate them as terrorists if funding isn't there you still will have that challenge so wh which comes first? Uh, first as uh, Mr. Habila said um, I want to do a small correction on the cost of violence it also includes every security operative police civil defense that have lost their lives in this venture we call our security challenges because ultimately they all wear the green white green that's our national flag and we train them in their institutions too so if you can just imagine the costs of just append the figure you begin to see the costs to the nation of these losses especially when one soldier or one policeman or one security operative dies it's not just about his death and the effect on the family and the children and how his soul will rest in peace. There is so much economical, economic or financial implication, actually. And if you look at that impact economically, even what chunk of our GDP is that figure? How much is our GDP? Between 2017 and now, it's been hovering between 2.6 to 2.8 or so. But percent. You know, that's violence, the effect, the impact of violence on GP, GDP between 2.4 and uh, 2.7. That's a chunk, even though you're hearing just 2%. Now to your, to your question proper. 
You see, the situation here is such that calling them terrorists sets certain things straight, especially when you look from the outside in. In here, there could be political considerations and all the nuances and petty, petty issues that add up to what we call politics here. But security doesn't know politics. You see, outside in is simply internationally. What are we looking at? If you look at many reports I have seen, the figures are just what you can call an outside perception of what is happening inside. And they are not far from what the natural, or sorry, the average Nigerian is feeling. So what I'm trying to say here, what I'm trying to say here is, they have to be first and foremost called what they have aspired to and want to be. Take the definition of terrorism from any perspective you like and put it right over the activities of these people. And you see what I'm talking about. They attack innocent civilian citizens. They do so in villages and communities. So much so you need bulldozers to bury people. They threaten governance. They even take taxes. They seek to even set up their own fiefdom. By their fiefdom, I'm talking of their own government. And uh, when we actually try to use diplomacy soft force, I'm speaking for bandits today. I'm a bandit. When you are talking security, when you are talking soft force, what I see, what the bandit sees is weakness. Yes, what he sees is weakness. When you approach many meaningful Nigerians have, people with clout, people with very, very impeccable and how do I put it now? Whether clerics, academicians, politicians, these people have successfully rubbished, you know, they have successfully rubbished all these avenues, all these bridges. They have burnt them one after the other over a period of seven, eight, nine years. So there is really no point, you know, wasting time. They actually want to be terrorists. They have, we're in a democracy, right? They have earned the right to be called terrorists across any parameters. Why it took us so long to get to say this or get to admit this to the point where I see Senator Gubir and uh, the Senate president to putting these things in perspective is another day story. But I tell you, in the now time of things, if we were to have a debate and the bandits were to sit with me, I think I will concede that to them. No, they have earned that right to be terrorists. But now that you agree that they have been branded terrorists, what now uh, would be the question? Um, I remember I mean, we, for a very long time, uh, it wasn't until 2014 that a good number of countries all over the world branded Boko Haram as terrorist, as a terrorist organization. Now we are banded, I mean, we, we, we could identify Boko Haram as a section. Uh, these bandits are just all over the place, all over the place in various parts of the country, especially in northern Nigeria, where some actions are being taken now. Now that that declaration has been proposed, it's not been declared yet. It's just a proposition of the Senate. What now? Even if the president says, okay, now they are, uh, they are terrorists, what then? It's to you, uh, Captain. Yes, uh, okay, thank you. Boko Haram was branded or declared a terrorist organization, and we know what has followed. Whatever is going to follow after we have taken this one step of calling a spade, a spade, is left to be seen. It's also up to those at the political strata of government to begin to see exactly what needs to be done. Saying a group is a terrorist organization comes with implications. Now, I cannot speak for politicians. It's not an, uh, it's not an area of my competence, you know. But when it comes to security operations, you must ensure that when you are talking about terrorism to security operatives, you know exactly what you are doing. When you tell a general or a policeman or an intelligence operative of the DSS that he's going after terrorists, 
I'm talking to my political leaders now. I hope you know exactly what you mean. Terrorism is not for play, not politically. You can't play with them politically. The moment we say a group is a terrorist, and from my small dashboard, I have weighed all the possible options. I have profiled bandits. Yes, they started as a very insignificant group of people, and they've waxed stronger. I've said they are bolder, they're getting bolder on so many different uh, news and print media. Now that they have earned that right, and we have agreed politically that they should be branded, I hope we understand the implication. It's not about scoring political points. There is a lot to be done, and once that word is pronounced, whether as proposed or it sails through and they are branded terrorists, it's a brand new, what the soldier, what the security operatives has, the security implications, the operations implications change. So it's not going to be this idea of sound bites and verbiages. If you don't mean to, I, I had someone say this morning that you, 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 don't, you don't even promulgate a law if you cannot enforce it, you know. And I give that to him, that's true. So you don't sit down and because you want to be heard or you want to be popular or you want to end some political points, you start playing with people's lives. No, it shouldn't be that. On the same issue, but I would like you to take on the issue of what the implications are for the police. Uh, just very, very recently, the vice president represented the president at the, at the commission in River State. Look. We know that there are challenges of funding, you know, for the police. Um, so, Mr. Habila, uh, what, in your opinion, would be the implication of this kind of suggestion to the president from the Senate that the bandits should be declared a, a, a set of terrorists? What are the implications for the police? Okay, the implication of declaring the bandits as... Um, terrorists, is, is, is to fill in the gap. Uh, when you talk about bandits, you're talking about those who steal, those who kidnap for ransom, because in Nigeria, most kidnaps are giver, kidnap for ransom. And then uh, these are people who also, uh, even though do, have not developed an ideology, and um, their intention may not have to overthrow the government, but create apprehension, fear in the people, because when they go in to kidnap and um, their identity of those kidnappers are unveiled, they get back to unleash terror on that particular group, that particular community that, that, that um, openly disclose who these people are. And so if, if, if they are declared uh, terrorists, it means that um, they are a group also that um, want to look at the country they want to change the leadership. They want to change the government. They want to take away this, the government and um, replace another one uh, because they are, they are united in ideology and in um, what, what thinking about the future. And so these are people who do not believe in the government of the day as a terrorist. Uh, they have an idea and they have something that binds them together and they now want to, 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 to unseat they want to change the status quo of, 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 of the country. Uh, and so when, when, when you declare them a bandit, the implication for the Nigerian police is that um, more of, of the action and some of the things that ordinarily uh, you would not do in terms of getting them down, more them down when you meet them. And then the equipment to be used will also uh, change. You don't need to use um, a smoke. You also don't, don't need to use... Um, the process of, of, of demobilizing them, because these are people who want to divide the country, who want to make sure that uh, the country come to a standstill for them to be able to establish an authority to replace the status quo. Well, uh, let, let's expand this conversation uh, and uh, bring in Colonel Yomi Dare, who is former director, Army Legal Services. He joins us virtually on the program this morning. It's great to have you, Colonel. Now, uh, 
let's get the benefit, if we can, of your uh, legal perspective as, as well as law enforcement and security perspective as well. I, I, legally speaking now, first, I'd like to know if you think this is a way to go, this, this new position of the Senate declaring the bandits as terrorists. But also, if you could add to that, legally speaking, in terms of perhaps prosecution, the way things are approached, uh, do you think this changes the entire outlook of our fight against is it banditry now or terrorism? Yeah, uh, good morning, uh, 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 Channel's team, and good morning, uh, my uh, fellow uh, 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 commentators, uh, gentlemen. Uh, thank you for having me on board here. Uh, well, I've been uh, uh, sorry I, I joined in late. Uh, I was having some technical issues, uh, and, uh, but uh, uh, so I was able to, to get all the, the comments uh, from my colleagues out there, um, uh, be that as it may. Um, what I'd like to say here is that uh, I'm very, very aware of uh, the, the, the issue, the topical one right now, where the se senator has called for the, the uh, declaration of uh, all these sex as uh, terrorists. I, I, I want to say here that um, this, is, this is really long overdue. It's long overdue. Um, I, I did propose, I remember back in 2009 uh, at, a, at a Senate uh, uh, presentation to the House of, uh, I mean, to the uh, Senate uh, Committee on the Security back then, both, both the Senate and the House of Representatives uh, in 2009, yes, I think I believe that, yeah, that um, it, it's, what, what, what we need to do is uh, to, to, to promulgate the law such that uh, uh, terrorists, uh, the, the, the punishments, anybody found guilty of any act of terrorism, the, the punishment should be death. And especially if such act has led to the loss of life, you know. Uh, I, I, I think the problem we have is enforcement. I mean, talk is cheap, you know. And we can see what is happening now. The terrorist is just next door and is ready to strike anyone. Now they've started moving now. We've had cases whereby former ministers, uh, 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 National Assembly members, and their families, they have been kidnapped. Even in Lagos now, that used to be, you know, it, it, it wasn't as pronounced, but that's almost become a daily thing now. And people have been uh, kidnapped. Uh, uh, like Captain Aliu said, it is high time we call a spade by its real name. Let's not play the hostage. We have done it for so long. We do really need to. And I am glad that the Senate has come out to ask Mr. President, you know, to declare all this sex. Because what happens here is that it's just, it's just, it's just uh, a, a thing of nomenclature. When it's convenient for them, they call themselves herdsmen. When it's convenient for them, they call themselves bandits. When it's convenient for them, they become kidnappers. Well, gentlemen, all these acts, yeah. All these acts are acts of terrorism. If you really look at the definition, because they terrorize, they terrorize. So let the law, let the law, be promulgated such that if you contravene or if you are caught in that act, then you know, you are, you are dealt with accordingly. And aside that, I also want to propose that all these militant groups, there must be a total prescription, just like the IPOP has been prescribed and, and branded terrorists. The same thing should apply to every other group, every other group. We must not take chances. We're just sitting down and our country has been turned into a country where anything can go. Anybody can just wake up and want to take the law in, in, into their hands. And um, we, 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 we must do less of legal uh, uh, gymnastics here. We must take the bull by the horns. Well, talk what about good for the country. Is okay, we yes. will, uh, we'll get more perspective from you. With regard, take regards to taking the bull by the horn when we rem when we return in just a moment. So do stay with us.
All right, welcome back. Uh, we're talking about uh, the suggestion, uh, the motion that was moved on the floor of the Senate. Yes, not new, because Senator Barry Bay has spoken about this several times. Several other people have also said, look, this is the way to go. But, Colonel, when you say no need for legal gymnastics, uh, and then we should just take the bull by the horn. But we also do remember that, I mean, when you talk about enforcement being the issue, how do we reconcile that? Because not long ago, when the president said, look, if people are bearing arms illegally, they should be shot. No, I don't think any news reports has made the rounds about that being carried out. So uh, concerning enforcing that and taking the bull by the horn, how do we take the bull by the horn if enforcement is a challenge? Uh, uh, Chamberlain, you, 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 you've, you've answered the question. <laughs> you, have, you have answered the question. You so said the problem that we have is we, we just sit down and we talk, we talk, we talk. And we politicize everything. We politicize everything. Just like when Nigerians want to take on the armed forces, and especially the Nigerian army. And then you just take them, you know, to the cleaners. And you forget that. These people are out there, you know, putting their lives on the line for you to close your eyes and sleep. Okay? Definitely, there's, they're, they're, they're a part of the society. They are not insulated completely from what is happening in the society. So definitely, you'll have a few bad eggs, you know? And that's every, every segment, every segment of the society, you have that. But that, is, that does not, you know, guarantee or warrant, you know, your condemning, the, you know, the Nigerian army. Their efforts must be commended, okay? I'm just talking about Nigerian army, you know. The same thing goes with the Nigerian police. In the Nigerian police, we have, you know, quite dedicated and very hardworking and honest people. At the same time, we still have a few bad eggs, okay? We must, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's they, this, these are our law enforcement you know, uh, agencies, our organizations. So we must give them all the support that they require, okay? Now, how do you reconcile? Even as we speak, we still have this issue of Boko Haram on the front burner. People are dying. They are joining forces with ISWAP. They are joining forces with ISIS. They are expanding. They are being funded. We got the list of of, of, of some people from, the, from Dubai who, were, who, who were, uh, are listed as, as sponsors of Boko Haram. Now tell me, has anything happened to them? The answer is just no, capital no. Capital no, they are no ghosts. These people exist. So why not just take those people and make an example of them? And that's the way to go. Okay, you see, uh, 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 the, 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 the people commit crimes. They, 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 when it's convenient, they say they are, they, are, they are kidnappers. When it's convenient for them, they say they are bandits. You know, and they do all sorts of heinous crimes. And as such, because nothing is happening, people, people, people take advantage. People take liberty, and they do it with impunity. Okay, uh, and Colonel. aside that, look at we are talking about now. They, they, you, you, uh, they, we, we, we have not even completed this process. The healing, the healing has not, is not done yet. People are still suffering. Women have lost their husbands. Young ladies have been turned into widows. And yet, we are, think, we are talking about uh, uh, rehabilitating the bandits. We're talking about rehabilitating the bandits. You know? So it, it, it doesn't add up at all. It doesn't add up. I think we've, we have politicized too much. Okay. If I could just quickly follow up on a point you made. If I could just quickly follow up on a point you made about, you know, calling them this. I, I just, uh, I mean, so that we can properly, you know, place this issue. I'd like to know, really, uh, what's the propriety of asking the president to be the one to designate bandits as terrorists? Because I wonder that, how did we even come to term them bandits in the first place? Was this something that the president uh, did in the first place? So in terms of propriety, I mean, who should do what? How did we even come to call them bandits in the first place? Uh, uh, whose job is this really? Well as, well, as far as I'm concerned, 
it's, it even starts with the, with the, with the National Assembly. <laughs> you know, it starts with the National Assembly. They, they, have, they have all the legal powers to set this in motion. And all they need to do is to send it to the president for his accent. And if he refuses to accent to it, they know what to do. You know, so everybody sits back and saying the president, the president, the president, the president, the president, what can the president do? It's just, it's just one person. And then with his, uh, you know, with, with his uh, 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 um, uh, uh, advisors, with his staff, with his ministers and what, what not, you know? So we know. I, I mean, we've discussed this on this, on this, on this, on this uh, uh, forum. What stops us declaring the Northeast I, you know, declaring a state of emergency, even before things went as bad as they are now. But nobody is saying anything. We're mm. just carrying on. For so, uh, Colonel, years? You, you think that this is uh, at least this should start with the National Assembly uh, and then perhaps proceed to the president. So let me take this to Mr. Habila uh, quickly, because I know that prior to this point, there's been a lot of talk about perhaps a, a certain what do I say? What do I, what do I call it now? Um, is it a conspiracy uh, using the term banditry or bandits instead of terrorists? But I'd like to know, perhaps from your experience and uh, the benefit of um, your time in the police, how did we even come to start uh, terming them as bandits? Was it a name that they said they wanted to go by or it was just a term that perhaps the police, the military said, let's tag them this because this is what we see and this is what they look like? Yes, um, the acronym of um, bandits that is presently being used is, is to lower the level of, of, of criminality that these people engage in, um, bringing it down uh, to look as if um, these are crimes that ordinarily the security agencies should process them through the, the law, um, charging them to court and... Um, gathering in, um, information, gathering evidences, and prosecute. And so, over time, uh, they've forgotten also that when you say bandits, you're talking about those people who go kidnap, people who commit crimes, people who also, um, you know, um, work on the psychology of, 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 of the people, or of the citizen, uh, for them to, to be apprehensive and, um, and, and full of fear, uh, these people, when they see and also get involved and, 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 and become victims, they do not uh, bring out uh, the identity or um, an idea about who, of, of who these people are. And so when, when you talk about bandits, you're talking about those who, who, who commit crime, those who steal, those who kidnap, those who also go uh, to do some other things. But when you talk about terrorism, we're talking about a group that is well organized a group that is well-funded, a group also that wants to change the status quo of a country or a group or an individual. And they do that with all possible means um, to, to, to make sure that they, they, they take over the government, to make sure that um, the ideology that they have would stand and would be what the country or that particular group will have to obey. And so if you say... Uh, Boko Haram, that, um, that um, education uh, is, is, is evil. And, and you, you are now trying to say these people, uh, people must not go to school. And so the bandits are no longer bandits because they are, they are involved in a lot of activities that have also qualified them, like we said, as bandits and as as, as, as uh, terrorist, and so um, when you talk about terrorism and terrorists, um, you you go all out to ensure that you either bring them down or take them out from where they are. But when you talk about bandits, you're talking about people that you arrest, you detain, you frame, um, you do your draw your charges and send to court and bring your evidence. I, I, I think that. Um, Using bandits um, is, 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 to, is to bring down the level of, of, of carnage that they've, they've, they've been involved in, and yeah. therefore these people are qualified. Yeah, but, uh, but Mr. Support, Abila, you know, um, a couple of terrorism. things come to mind right there, you know, when you say using that term bandit. But we also have, we do remember that when 
you know, reporters go to maybe certain scenarios and police are talking to them about some of these men or Parisian. They call them bandits as well. So if there's anyone who should know or designate them properly, shouldn't it be the police? Because they see how they operate. So why should, should the police keep calling them bandits or call them what they are, the rights that they've earned to be called terrorists, as you say? I think that we, the police need to change. Um, we're coming from where we have seen. The Nigerian police should, should, and other security agencies should come together and ensure that we no longer use bandits, kidnappers, and uh, people who go to schools uh, to, to take children out of the whole environment and then take them out and then you, you, you trek with them a distance and the community is saying nothing. And so I think that uh, we should, should find a better way of describing these people than calling them bandits. We have underrated um, the kind of carnage that they've caused in Nigeria as a country. Well, well, we'll look to the police and see if they could imbibe that. Uh, but, Captain, let me bring this to you. When you say, well, the, the mindset of an officer changes when they're termed terrorists. But we have also seen that for years now, uh, we've been battling Boko Haram terrorist organization and many will many think that we've been just approaching or handling them with kids gloves so what really changes even if we designate them collectively as no longer bandits but terrorists okay let me use the bandits approach based on the questions how did it come let's do let's do an etymology of the word bandits in the context we're discussing uh, sometime way back, was it 2015, 2014, we dwelt on that here. And at that time, we were still arguing about the ethnic coloration of offenses committed by people who were plundering people's farms, were plundering people's property, people's storage facilities in rural areas. And I recall saying categorically here that it's not about where they are from. Nobody fell from a mango tree. You have to be from somewhere. So if you label it a Fulani headsman or Yoruba past, uh, farmers, you fall back into that very vicious loop we found ourselves in going round in circles. I recall insisting that, you know what? These people are not necessarily headsmen. When you say headsmen, it's much broader. If you narrow it, they are bandits. Now, bandits itself is an old English terminology that was used to describe outlaws way back. And these outlaws come, if you are old enough and you watched films like Gunsmoke and Wild Wild West, you understand what, who a bandit is. They come from wherever they will. They could even be transnational. They plunder, they loot, and take off. Over a period of five, six, seven years, these same people we have gotten used to calling bandits have morphed into something else. And of course, they had to because they kept doing things and getting bolder. They became so daring at a point they are even attacking military institutions. And so you find out that as I said earlier, I deliberately decided to look at it through their own eyes and they have earned the right to become terrorists. I mean, let's relate with the ordinary person who is listening. A child who started taking meat from the port, he was stealing at home, domestic theft. He became bolder and started stealing chickens and before you knew it, he was stealing cows and he moved to the city and started taking cars and banks. Yes. So. Sounds like you, 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 you thought maybe they had a plan to become terrorists. That, that when you say they earned the right to be called terrorists, like you said, was, you think maybe they had a plan, okay, we want to be known as terrorists. There was really no plan per se, looking at it from 2015. But then the condition, the circumstances, you know, there's this thing businessmen call localization and um, location of industries. The business thrived. I mean, someone who was selling bonds by the roadside probably didn't have a, a plan to become a corporation. 
But as things improve, the business will expand. Okay. Now, the, the, you, twice earlier this morning, you have pointed us to the economic costs of um, losing gallant officers in the process of defending the internal and ex external security of the country. And it just raises one question on my mind right now. The investment will only increase with this proposition by the Senate. But there is a nagging issue that the president and everyone in the security sphere have talked about, and that is of synergy, of collaboration between all or among all the security agencies that we have. Uh, that is still a challenge, isn't it? And if that is, does it get any better or worse with this proposition by the Senate to declare the bandits as terrorists? Uh, certainly, indeed, it is. You know, calling them terrorists, as I told you, comes with a lot of implications. And these implications could come in form of rejigging the approach to how to take on them. It could also give the armed forces or the security agencies more latitude on what can be done and what cannot be done. I'm talking, I'm, I'm, I'm talking to our political nuances now, what my boss also called uh, legal gymnastics. Now, for the armed forces or the security agencies, if a pronouncement is made that these people are terrorists, it comes with a lot of implications, as I've said. So what is going to be the police blueprint for entering into counter-terrorist or anti-terrorist mode, depending on how we want to go about it? What is going to be the immigration blueprint? How will the civil defense key in? While the army is doing what they are doing, what will even traditional rulers, what will be chieftains, what will be clerics be doing? All of this form what you can call the, the, the minute grains that add up to uh, you know, the big picture. You know, look at it like a cube of sugar. A cube of sugar is just little grains, millions of them that come up to become one. So you can't just say we are declaring them a terrorist group and then go and sleep. No, that in itself keyed, it keys, you know, it, 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 it initiates a lot of activity, what we like to call concurrent activity. And those concurrent activities will be measured. Each person has specific goals to attain or achieve that will support, you know, the entire mission. So you are going to be looking at what we call some kind of mutual you know, liaison, very intimate liaison between the armed forces, the religious leaders, and so many people. Because if you don't, you, you just end up, you know, spoil, uh, mending one and spoiling nine. The challenge that we have had over time. I would recall, and you also would recall, a good number of times that the President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria has called security chiefs into, an, uh, into a room, into a meeting, and admonished them to collaborate. Over and over again, we have heard this. So, and there's another you know, conversation going out there, you may want to validate it, that at the top echelon of all the security services that we have, there is a mutual understanding of who does what and all of that. But the foot soldiers don't seem to get the memo. So the question I'm asking here is, since you have talked about the fact that you know, there is a need for that synergy and all of that, when they get to the fields, who takes the lead, or doesn't it matter? Because at the end of the day, when they get to a field of operation and these different elements that you talked about have to operate, uh, there needs to be someone who should be calling the shots, so to speak. So how would you propose that that collaboration work, both at the top echelon and on the fields? It's just one word. From the rifleman to the constable to the lowest operator in the DSS and all the sister security agencies, up to the highest in the same agencies, even and up to the office of our ministerial appointment, relevant ministerial appointment holders. It's one word, result. I've always said this, I can't say it enough. It's result. So it's one thing for you to come and say, you know what? This is what we're going to do. 
This is how much is going to be required. These are the timelines. These are the performance indicators. That's what I'm saying. Those who are calling the shots are those we hold for results. If who calls the shots at home? You are the husband. You you take you take responsibility for whatever comes from the house, whether it came from the backyard or from your bedroom is not the issue. And of course, before you take the heat, you also go and do what you have to do to those who did not deliver so you can, who did not drive your success. These things are not magical. If you go into any security agency, you find out that it's very, very compartmentalized from up down. And everybody is responsible to somebody who is responsible to somebody until it gets to the president. So if the president is not getting results from his downline, he changes him. Of course, his downline will go and shake hands with those who did not drive his successes. The problem is, when it comes to Nigeria peculiarly, we become pussyfooted when, as my boss said, when we have to take bulls by the horns. But it's there. I mean, it's there. Let's go back to the boss you referenced, uh, you know, talking about taking the bull by the horn. Uh, Colonel Darry, yes, mean, indeed. The, the, the men on the field, right, they know what they face. They know these people, at least to a large extent. They know the kinds of weapons that these people come with. Now, this is for Colonel Yomi Dari. I mean, the people in those areas know the kinds of attacks they've come under in recent times, the kidnappings, the number of people that have been kidnapped. So these facts are out there. So while this new direction, if, if you may call that, from the Senate is a good talking point, a good soundbite, uh, you wonder what really should change operationally. We have the Terrorism Prevention Act, which clearly defines what acts of terrorism are. It, it talks about kidnapping. It, 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 it actually puts punishment up to life imprisonment, fine of 150 million naira. So sure. these things are there. But operationally speaking now, we've had the Terrorism Act for as long as, what, 2011? Um, we, we still have the challenge of terrorism now, banditry, which has morphed into terrorism. So operationally speaking, I'd like you to weigh in on that because we've touched on that as well. What do you think should change? What, what more can we say, uh, Coyote? We've said it time and time over, you know, we just come here, we talk, we talk, we talk, and then nothing happens. You see, the truth is that we, the, the National Assembly, they know what to do. The leadership of the National they, they, have, they know what to do. It starts from the National Assembly. And all they need to do is to articulate this uh, things and then send it to the to, to the president for his asset and if, if, if it's not accepted to within a stipulated period of time they know exactly what to do I, I think we should just stop romancing ourselves you know because we are talking about lives here every day we keep losing people people are dying you know even the other time we all saw it it went viral on the social media apart from this very last one that uh, that a senator is calling uh, you know, for the for 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 the for the for the branding of uh, of all this group as a terrorist. We we had uh, 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 when one of the senators uh, from Kogi West, uh, specifically Senator Smart at the ME, you know, he even went into tears. He went so emotional, you know, right in, in the full glare of the of, 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 of the whole nation and the world, you know, saying that the National Assembly must stand up to it. So a lot Nigerians are sacrificing. You know, you know, sacrificing, keeping all these members of uh, the National Assembly there and their aides. It's costing daily billions for, uh, 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 of Nigerian money, you know. So what are they doing? What are they doing? Very, let, let, let me rephrase, if I, if so, I, I mean, just to push this home. So the question is, what more can change because uh, there's a sense that we can do way more than we're doing yet we're not doing it and like i referenced the men on the field know what they are facing i mean they know what they have to do really i mean when you're when you're confronted by heavy weaponry you you, you know what you have to do and the people of those areas as well they they, they, they know what they are facing so uh, the question still is what more can we do in this fight against banditry beyond you know, tagging them as terrorists. I mean, what more can be done on the field? Yes, there's, 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 there's need to inject more weapons, more funding, more welfare, okay? There's need to inject that. It is not just on paper. It's not just on paper. 
we have the we, 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 we have the means, we have the money. All right? Here in this country, people no longer steal millions, people steal billions, and they get a slap on the wrist and they go. You know, all this money. We have we have we have something. This 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 uh, uh, Boko Haram, this terrorist thing is hy hydra headed now. It has become it has grown into a very big monster that is consuming virtually everybody, all over. Nowhere, nobody is insulated. The terrorist is just next door. Why can't we acquire drones? Why can't we deploy drones? The other time, contracts were awarded for CCTVs to be deployed all over. The CCTVs were, 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 were just dotted in, in a few places in Abuja and Lagos, even an, as we speak. Are they working? They're not working, they're not functional. And this, this, this contracts were awarded to human beings, not ghosts. What has happened? Nothing. Nothing. You know? So these are some of the things. You know? So it's high time we, we, uh, 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 the, 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 the National Assembly, you know, allow these security agencies to, to operate. They should allow them to operate fully. They should support them with funds. And of course, not just supporting them with funds because we have situations whereby funds are provided, but yet these funds don't get to the, to the man on the field. There must be transparency. There must be accountability. There must be justification for these funds. So these are some of the things we are, we, we, we are talking about here. All right? And of course, we'll be paying lip service to community, community policing, community policing, state policing. Why are we afraid? There's you know, so me, me, much. Well, uh, Mr. Habila will definitely weigh in on that, maybe uh, when we return from this. So both of you have also referenced the question of more funding as one of the solutions to all of this. But we'll explore that and more when we return. So stay with us. Welcome back. Continuing our conversation on whether or not uh, the bandits be designated as terrorists as, as was moved on the floor of the Senate yesterday. So what next steps should follow that? I mean, some of the guys have said, look, a lot stops at the bulk, at the table of the leadership of the National Assembly because certain laws have got to be made and they need to follow through. But let me talk about funding, which uh, some of you have raised. Colonel Dare, for instance, you said there's got to be more funding. For instance, uh, some time ago there was questions. Uh, there were questions about the uh, seven-year, eight trillion naira defense spending, and they said, "Look, in spite of that, we we'll still have this kind of challenge." And then the 2020 Global Terrorism Index, which was released uh, in 2020, did also show that uh, we remained on the third spot for the fifth year in a row. So is it really about more funding, given those indices that are out there for everyone to see? Uh, uh, is that for me, Chamberlain? Yes, please. Well, you recall that I said that it is not just enough to release these funds, but there has to be uh, proper uh, accountability for the use of these funds. There must be justification, okay? And that the, the, the men out there, the men on the field, the men on the front line must feel the impact. Uh, we've seen some occasions, not, not, I, I don't think it's with this present uh, 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 set of uh, uh, service chiefs, but we've, we've had situations in the past when troops have uh, more or less uh, protested on the front line, complaining about uh, lack of uh, uh, food, lack of water, lack of equipment, you know? So, so the, I mean, it's not, it's not just enough to, to announce that, uh, that, uh, that three billion, you know, has been uh, uh, allocated or, or given to the, to, to, to the Minister of Defense, and just for some people to just sit down and appropriate or misappropriate this fund, 
so yeah, there must be there must be uh, transparency there must be accountability in the in the in the spending of this uh, of this money and like i rightly said there is a need for funds for funds okay uh, yeah. let, let, let me bring in the situation Pardon me. Let me bring in Mr. Habila on the same subject matter because he equally thinks that there's got to be a lot more funding. But Mr. Habila, we've seen the same kind of scenario play out with men of the force, police force, who we uh, see on a regular basis out there on the streets and clearly shows that not too sure if those funds actually get to the final destination. So should, they, should we focus on addressing that challenge before we talk about allocating more funds? Because don't forget, there was more funding for the police some time ago. We don't even know if they've received that as of yet. Yes, um, talking about if these funds that are provided are channeled through the proper way as, as, as requested, I think that is not very difficult for anybody to, to put to check. I, I th also think that um, suspicion of diversion of funds or unutilizing funds should not be something uh, here that, that could, could take us back because there are better ways and there are already established ways of, of checking them. I, I should think that um, if the government also feels that um, these this funds are not properly utilized for the purpose for which they are meant, I also think that the government could, could, could go ahead uh, to ask for whatever each of these services want, and then um, they can go ahead to place order uh, based on the request, so as to uh, you know, assure in integrity in the system. So I should think that um, for the Nigerian police, um, we, the Nigerian police is quite large and is well spread. But I can also tell you that even when the government provides all these facilities, by voting out money and by acquiring them. We still need also uh, to ensure that there is this uh, synergy before, between these um, security agencies and uh, we should be able to, to come together and say, okay, we have one goal, we have one purposes, we have one assignment, and in doing that, uh, we emphasize superiority of ranks while carrying out our duties rather than superiority of service. When, when you said my service is more superior than yours, you've already dumped the morale of the other person you are referring to because everybody has something special to offer. And so when, when we actually say, okay, uh, let's, let's go with superiority of ranks, then you, 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 you tend to see that uh, there's, there's unity and that, uh, whatever that whatever assignment that is given, will be, be prosecuted because everybody is bringing what he has to the table and, and, and that will go a long way uh, to, to enable us to prosecute this, this operation to such an extent that um, results are found. The one also is the communities, the communities, the, the people themselves. Because the people don't feel um, cared for by whatever thing, whether the local, the state, government. These people are not willing to volunteer information that can be converted into intelligence. And so you can't go and operate without the cooperation, without the input of the community that are affected because they see these things, they know more of this, but they hold back the thing because they also have they've developed one um, dummy to say that um, some of the security agencies cannot be trusted. And so they hold back their information that would have helped in ensuring that the operations that is being undertaken um, run smoothly and result-oriented. And so there are a lot to do um, outside providing um, logistics, providing whatever requirements. The, the, the community must be involved. The community must be brought together and be told that they, they have the ability to end this carnage in their communities by looking out and volunteering statements not minding what it is. And um, it's over, overrated that the security agencies are uh, used, used to divulge information. Um, sometimes they're part of the system of this criminality. And um, it's not enough for the community to be discouraged from, from adding value to, to, to most of this operation.
You know, you have raised a very important point about collaboration with, uh, you know, locals, people in the community. And uh, so let me take this back to Captain Amar and get his perspective. So uh, to get people to buy in or to collaborate with security agencies, there needs to be trust. And I think this interestingly ties back to the conversation around, uh, you know, uh, transparency in spending. Because they say, he who must come to equity must come with clean hands. So you hear that there are a lot of classified things when it comes to security, right? How declassifiable, for example, are security votes to state? You hear some governors tell you, well, if we tell you what we do with those funds, and this, this is for Captain Omar, uh, by, by the way, if we tell you what we do with those funds, uh, maybe there will be trouble and, and all that. So when it comes to spending, uh, you know, funding and disbursement and the rest, uh, should we be doing more in terms of declassifying just what exactly we're using those funds for? So people can say, okay, well, this seems right. Let me support uh, the security agencies in this fight. Have you heard, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> have you heard of the Snowden files? I'm just asking, you know what the Snowden files is? The, that there was an incident that was popularly known as the Snowden files? Well, if you haven't, Google it and go read up. Nothing under the sun 2021 earth is classified anymore let me repeat myself nothing under the sun 2021 earth is classified anymore. even though we know what happened after those files were leaked and Beautiful. what is still happening now if you've heard about the deep web you've heard about the dark web let's not digress let me answer your question i tell you something for a fact if security votes can be counted, and you know it's 2 billion or 3 billion or 5 billion, they can be accounted for. Okay, by my roadside, uh, by my roadside accounting knowledge, worst case scenario, if you don't really want to put too much light there, you can just, con you know, just put it under miscellaneous expenses. But then it's not being done for a reason because there is a chunk which you will call miscellaneous expenses that <laughs> even the market woman will begin to wonder exactly what are you talking about. Fine. Leave things as they are. Security votes are cash endorsements that are meant to give leverages, that are meant to ensure that those who receive them can work a bit more proactively and deliver. So let's do a uh, a, 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 an aggregate of all the security votes that has been released in the last two years. And then let's do a comparison of what we have had as security in the last two years. Is there any correlation? Does it begin to add up and make sense? I mean, you don't need your six senses to know these things. So when some people actually tell us certain things, we take it with a pinch of salt, but they do one thing here. They open a window of insight into how their heads work. So when you are in governance or you are in government and you are talking to the public, you must understand that the people you are talking to, they are just human and they are probably even more intelligent than you are. Now, why is it that despite all the, 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 the expenditures we are having, we're not getting the kind of quality of service. We're not getting service delivery that should kind of be at par with the amounts we're hearing. Yes, we know that uh, the Naira has challenges. You know, it's always kind of diving and what have you. Yes, we do know that. But let me tell you something where the whole thing adds up. There is a correlation between the reckoning you get. Okay? and how much you spend. So when you look at the average policeman now, when I, not even the average policeman, let's talk about the ordinary policeman, the constable. You look at the private soldier. What you see, does it really command the reckoning of that civilian? As opposed to probably when you see, what country can I use other than the US and England? We go for peacekeeping operations, so my, my colleagues know what I'm talking about. Now, they say soup we sweep, na money may come. You don't have children who come out to a party looking like mongrels. 
and you, their father, is dressed so well and expect any respect. We see well-dressed soldiers, yes. But the one that is in the trenches, what are people seeing? That's where your reckoning lies. That's where the respect lies. Why do you think everybody says Marines, Marines, Marines? Yes, they've, they've had some humbling moments. They've had some very, very uh, embarrassing moments. But then you see them, they look well-equipped. Whether the equipments are working or not is not the issue. But at least they look well-equipped. So whatever you hear is being spent on them, you're bound likely to believe. So these things are not rocket science. They're just there, playing. And uh, the courage to just address these things and accept these things is where the problem lies. There will always be requests for more money. If you ask me if I need more money, of course I will say yes. But then, what are you doing with it? Are we seeing things that actually tell us, okay, what we are seeing is close to the amount expended, or is it that some people just believe that there's a monopoly of common sense, you know, in, in, our, in our part of the world, where virtually we begin to see it as today, as I speak, I speak from my own heart now. It's like nonsense is becoming the new common sense. So we must be able to look at these things. We must look at these things so that as above, so below. And you see things just morph back and things move, you know, pari pasu. The civilians will have reckoning for their law enforcement agencies, and the law enforcement agencies can only love the civilians the more. Anything? Uh, pardon me, Colonel. Uh, Mr. Abela, um, uh, Captain. Mr. Abela, this, this was the point that uh, uh, Colonel raised some, in the, while he was making some points about state police. So reorganizing our security architecture has always been a major talking point, but what we do about that remains to be seen. So he thinks, yeah, the federal government has to control some of the police. The state governments themselves have equally have to have some control, while local governments can equally have some control. So decentralizing that should be the way to go. What say you on that? Well, a lot of talk top have been put across out there for um, present for um, state police. Um, I, I don't know whether we we'll have a template that will be different from some of the countries that have also had um, state police. The fear of, 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 of the security agencies and other people is, is the fear that um, the state apparatus might convert those police to do their bidding. Because already uh, there are issues with when police officers want to do their job as national um, officers, officers that are for everyone, they are for nobody, but they are for everybody. Sometimes uh, they get into problems with the authority for not, for not, um, for not um, flowing with the, some of, the, uh, some of the, the request or some of the directive that may have been given by government apparatus. And so... If we're talking about community, we don't want community police and we want state police, um, let, let some work be done and, and see if, if, if that can play out. But the fear is that um, this police can be owned by those that call the shots in those states and the likelihood of oppressing those of them who are not in authority. We've seen that even when it is the federal police. And so the fear and some of the things that we think we should do if there are templates set and that people will, will, will comply and that the, 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 the government officials and others will also want to obey that, then that's good. But I also see that the state, the, 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 the federal police that are in the various states, they work with the governors, they work with people in authority, they work with those who have the responsibility of driving the engine to ensure peace and security and things move well. R right now as it is, there's no commissioner of police there's no other person that is a police officer that is found or any security agencies that is found in, in a state that the government would give lawful orders and the government would request that things be done and the man would say, no, I wouldn't do that. There isn't any. And so if people still want uh, the, author, the, the, the police that the governors and other people want to, uh, to control, 
then we have to go back to the drawing board to look at at what point because there are people who also are not in government and so that's why we're saying that we have to be careful in calling for state police because other countries and, 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 and areas where state police have been you know introduced some have succeeded some has a lot of problems and so this is uh, a stand that we have to look at it critically yeah, but Mr. Habila, we think I mean it, it's on peace and security. It's on record nation. several. There are several records of governors who are in opposing political parties to the party at the centre who always complain that look they don't get certain things done when they want, and that uh, whoever is at the centre, whichever party is at the centre, opposes parties that are not at the centre in the state. So that is just clear. Just wanted to put that through. But let me get Connell to respond to some of the uh, experiential fear, as it were, that you have raised about concerns of having state police. Colonel, what do you think? Thank you very much, Chamberlain. Uh, with all due respect, I, I beg to defer from the, uh, from the position that I put forward by Mr. Abila in this regard. Who is afraid of who? Is, 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 uh, I, I mean, for crying out loud, as we speak, is the, is the police not being controlled by the federal government? Are they not also using the police as it suits the, 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 the federal government? You know? So looking at our population, we have grown beyond this pedestal state of, of just, just centralizing. We have to decentralize. We just have to decentralize. We need to, we need, we need to be transparent in this also. We need to recruit more people. You know? We have, we, have, we have debated on these things for, for just too long. What, what, what sense does it make? You bring somebody from Maiduguri to come and start operating in Port Harcourt. I mean, the, 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 the background, the environments are not the same. They are not the same. So why can't we localize this recruitment there? Because the man in Port Harcourt knows the nooks and crannies of Port Harcourt. Okay? And he will be able to better relate even up to the local level, up to the world level with the traditional rulers. If you, I mean, the whole fear is that, let's just face it, again, let's call a spade a spade. If the, if the, 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 governor, the governor or the party in power in the particular state is same as the central, as, 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 as the party, as, as the party at the, at, at the head of, uh, at the hands of affairs, in most cases, there's no problem. I mean, we have had cases in this country, especially, I, 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 I just have, to, I just have to, be, to, to be blunt about this, especially from Rivers, where the, 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 the commissioner of police, you know, was exchanging words with the, with the governor, calling each other names. I mean, that is not it. A governor, he is the chief security officer of his state. We must give him some respect. We must give him some allowance. We must allow him to exercise, you know, that power with his cabinet. Because if anything happens, he is called to, 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 to question. So if you say he's going to put the police in his pocket, he's going to act, you know, otherwise with the police, fine. The whole world is watching. After four years, let him continue. Okay. Okay. There, 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 there is so, so, many, so much to unpack in that conversation that you have raised. But, you know, there is this particular one that I, I, I think is also very, very crucial in tackling insecurity, which is the subject of discussion for the program today. And this is for you, Captain Umar. Um, twice at the beginning of this program, you have hinted at economic considerations, economic implications of our fight against insurgency, insecurity, banditry, terrorism, and all of that. And here now uh, is something else that has happened before in 2013, where about three states or thereabout, uh, which affected about three states at the time. But now we have about three to four states having their telecom services shut down. Back then, security agencies said it worked for a bit, but then the e economic implications on the people is quite significant. Many of you have told us, security agencies have told us, that one of the main triggers of insecurity is poverty. And telecom services shut down, historically, has also told us that it, when, when telecom services are shut down, poverty increases one way or another. It's a kind of 
irony, isn't it? Kind of juxtaposition here. How do we address this and get the kind of balance that you think we should? Uh, well, first we must understand something here. You can't give what you don't have. Yes, <laughs> you can't. And next, a stitch in time saves nine. The problems that have led to the eventual shutting down of telecoms facilities didn't start like this. They started small and morphed into an inferno, you know. If you look at it, the biggest fire has to start from a spark. So your fire safety and fire prevention policies will determine whether you get an inferno or you even get hellfire. It's all about a spark. Now, when you see an entire state being shut down on 2021 Earth Nigeria, and you know how we have come to depend on what we call the Internet of Things, okay? The Internet of Things is to life today as life is to the Internet of Things. Everything you can think of has to depend on the network. People are earning their livelihoods there. Families need it for communication with loved ones. There are economic implications. There are social implications, social cultural, even religious. There are services that have to be held, uh, is it, online now. And you want to finally shut it down and say, you know what? Because some few people who have no economic value whatsoever have overwhelmed us, let's shut it down. So let's accept that. What would you do probably if... It's like saying, you know what, let's go burn all the forests. Let's shut all the forests down. You without thinking about the ecological implication, without thinking about what you call the... the what is the balance? The, the greenhouse effect. So, yes, but... Unfortunately, Kaduna, for example, which is a city after my heart, I have reached out to people as close to Governor El Rufai as your head is to your ear. I would not elaborate or go into that. With solutions at a point when this thing couldn't have gotten to, let's shut down the network. Let's shut down the network. Let's see how that helps. And God knows what else we are going to shut down. But then again, underscoring what I said initially on this program, day by day, these jokers are earning the right, ipso facto, to be called terrorists. All right. <clears throat> we, at, uh, where we anchor this segment of this morning on this subject matter, so uh, Captain Ali Umar, Colonel Yomi Dari, and Mr. Joshua Kabila. Gentlemen, thank you all for your perspectives this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we do have some emails coming through, so we'll start with that of uh, Anams. Well, Anams thinks, look, nobody talks about the true welfare of soldiers, which should come first, apart from designating the bandits as terrorists. Then again, it's not just about the Senate allocating more funds, but there must be accountability on how the funds are spent. Funds are never the issue, but commitment from government and the judicial's use of it. Without security, we're getting nowhere. Soldiers should be well paid, kitted, armed, and supported with good insurance to motivate them. There's no reason why people in the Senate or civil service in the air-conditioned offices should earn more than our foot soldiers making their lives to keep us all safe. Take a look at this one from Festus Akimboyawa saying, whether these dangerous criminals are described as bandits or terrorists, they have declared war on our country and killing innocent Nigerians. Therefore, our armed forces must go after them at all costs. If the political will is there, our armed forces have the capacity to deal ruthlessly with them. Okay, so there you go. That is it. We'll look at uh, some of the, your messages uh, this morning. We we'll thank you all for letting us be part of your day today. It's the eve yep. of a good day coming. <laughs> oh, wow. How time flies. It's going to be October 1st. Oh, yes. Well, we'll see you then. But in the meantime, thank you. I'm Chamberlain. So. I'm Kyoto Kikulu. And I'm Ayo Makine. Have a wonderful day.